All right. I'm going to channel my inner Michelle Jewell and say, we are live. <laughs> and just wait for some attendees to start trickling in. Here they come. All right, and it is 3.04, so I'm gonna go ahead and start um, and get everything rolling so we don't uh, hopefully run too far over 5 p.m. I know it's late on a Friday. So really, really glad uh, to have everybody who's tuning in join us. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for part two of the Applied Ecology Minor Research Symposium. As many of you know, in addition to required coursework, every student who completes the minor must partner with a research mentor to collect and analyze data to answer a specific scientific question. This afternoon, we have eight students presenting the results of their research. Um, before we get started, I would also like to acknowledge that North Carolina State University sits on land that was originally stewarded by the Tuscarora and Catawba tribes. We honor these tribes today by recognizing this institution of higher education is built on land stolen from those who were here before the colonizers arrived. Additionally, this land has borne witness to over 400 years of the enslavement, torture, and systematic mistreatment of African people and their descendants. Indigenous Americans have shared their knowledge of the land and its resources since long before their first contact with European settlers and have continued to play a vital role in the development of our local communities, North Carolina and the nation. We honor these people today and every day by recognizing them in order to break the cycle of colonization and the continued erasure of indigenous and black peoples and other people of color. We must acknowledge the history of the spaces and places we occupy to both understand and unlearn the many ways that we have been socialized. Finally, before we get started, a few housekeeping logistics. Um, we will take questions after each presentation. If you would like to ask your question out loud, you can raise your hand using the raise hand icon that you should see at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar, and I'll call on you or unmute you. Um, I'll call on you and then unmute you after the talk is concluded. Or you can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time, and our presenters will answer them after their talk. Um, they'll either answer them live, um, or if we don't have time to answer your question uh, live and we need to move on to the next presentation, our presenters will be able to type answers to your questions using that same Q&A feature. So all of that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Our first presenter today is Annika Preheim, a senior in zoology. So Annika, if you could go ahead and share your screen. All right. And let's see. All right, how does that look? That's perfect. All right, so uh, my presentation is based on the effect of seagrass structural complexity on juvenile blue crab abundance in North Carolina. So uh, the blue crab, I'm, I'm sure many of you know, is a really important species in North Carolina. Uh, its scientific name, Kalanecti sapidus, translates to tasty, beautiful swimmer. And it is um, one of North Carolina's most valuable fisheries. It's estimated that it generates over $26 million annually um, just in landings. But as well as being financially important, it's also a really important keystone species to North Carolina's ecosystems. Um, so blue crabs are prey for um, other important fisheries species like um, red drum, snapper, menhaden, but also other animals like other crabs and seabirds and sharks, as well as these crabs are predators of um, crustaceans and vertebrates, and they help 
clean up um, dead and decaying material. But um, in 1999, prior to then, there had been pretty good uh, landings of crabs. But in 1999, there was a big population crash, as you can see the chart on the right. So the reason for the crash was not sure why. Uh, there was a decrease in average size of females. There was a 71% decline in spawning stock, a 64% decline in total landings. And there were two main theories that have been generated um, since the crash to sort of try and explain it. So the first one is recruitment overfishing, where there were too many crabs being brought in. Um, so there were too few left to reproduce to make up for the lost numbers. And the other was habitat loss. So um, these crabs use seagrass as a nursery habitat. So this theory that I worked on um, stated that these habitats were being lost. So before I go into my research, it's important to know a little bit about the life cycle of the blue crab. So they start off as these planktonic zoa in the ocean, and then they molt into this megalopa larval stage. Then the megalopa are brought in by storms and currents and waves into the inlets, um, into these seagrass beds where they molt into their juvenile instars. Then once they get a little bigger, they migrate and disperse more into the sounds and bays where they mature and reproduce. So I decided to focus my project on this stage in their um, development in, in the first incoming crabs into the seagrass beds. And the particular place that I decided to focus on was this Oregon Inlet, as you can see on the right, because it's a main recruitment corridor for these megalopa. And this particular inlet has a really high species diversity and abundance of seagrass, and as well as a really high crab abundance. So because I was working on um, the, the crab recruitment, my objective was to find a correlation or a lack of a correlation between the composition of these nursery seagrass habitats and the abundance of juvenile crabs. So I looked at two main um, variables, the shoot density of the seagrass and the abundance of seagrass species. So the first hypothesis was that an increased shoot density will correlate with a high crab abundance. So these, these little crabs are using the seagrass as protection. So I figured that more density would make better protection for the crabs. And the second hypothesis was that a high species richness of seagrass, so multiple species in one area, will also equate high crab abundance um, because of the biodiversity and ecosystem functioning theory, which states that more species richness means more habitat complexity, which means more spaces for the crabs. So because I was looking at both the crabs and the seagrass, um, I had to do two different main methods to collect data. So the first part was sorting crabs. So uh, my mentor in 2017 and 2018 um, went out to Oregon Inlet and got these suction samples of the habitat of like the bottom of the seabed. So um, back in the lab this year, I would take these suction samples, um, frozen bags, thaw them out and strain them through two different size strainers. So the large strainer, you can see picture two up on the right, go through with a magnifying glass, pick out any crabs you see. And then the smaller strainer, um, you go through that scoop by scoop, with a petri dish and a spoon under a dissecting scope to pick out any small crabs. And then you'd line them up and identify the species as the blue crab uh, and photograph them. And so overall, we had six sites in Oregon Inlet that were sampled twice a year after the new moon uh, when the tides bring in the larval crabs in August and October. And so at those same sites, um, for every site, she, uh, my mentor took a seagrass core, which is like a cross section of the seagrass species that are in the area. So similar to the crabs uh, samples, these are frozen. So in order to sort them, I'd thaw them out and go through each sample, pick out each um, stalk of seagrass and identify the species and then make a count of the species. Um, and so in North Carolina, there are these three species of seagrass. So we have Zostra marina, which is the picture number one, which is also known as eelgrass, and it's larger and more spaced out than the other species. And the second one is Rupia maritima, 
which is um, much thinner and more densely packed than Zostra, and Haliduli uh, righty, which is also very thin and very densely packed with a high density. So for the results, so all analysis was done both in Excel and R. Um, Excel was used to graph the data and R was used to find significance. And we ended up with a sample size of 19 sites once we had combined the shoot density data with the crab abundance data. So for the first part, um, I compared the seagrass shoot density with the crab abundance. And our p-value was 0.716, so there was no real correlation here. And we looked at both the total shoot density across each site, as well as the individual shoot density of each species. And you can see the graph on the right. Um, each point is color-coded based on the predominant seagrass species at that site. And so uh, you have blue crab abundance on the y-axis, shoot density on the x-axis, um, and really no correlation. They're sort of all over the place. Okay, and then for the second part, uh, we compared the habitat makeup to the crab abundance. And so this was looking at uh, the predominant species in each habitat and the average crab abundance based on the predominant species. So um, we did find a p-value of 0 0.0577, which we decided to count as significantly trending. And we found that Zostra um, had the lowest abundance of crabs, and Rupi and Haliduli had about the same abundance. And then we also looked at the um, species richness of and crab abundance. So sites that had only one species, or both species, or all three species of seagrass, and the average crab abundance. So we did find a possible trend, um, not significant, but a high abundance in the most diverse habitats. So habitats with all three species did have the highest crab abundance. Um, however, we only had two sites that had all three species. So a really low sample size, which may, um, may be part of the reason why we found this difference. So for the first, uh, the first main thing that we looked at, which was the predominant seagrass species, um, we did find that the, the lowest abundance was in zoster habitats, which was surprising um, because the previous studies have uh, suggested that crabs prefer zostra. So a few reasons why this might be. Um, it might be because there's less quality zostra. Um, this seagrass is really susceptible to warm water and it senesces when the water gets too warm. Um, so it may be that the warming temperatures, climate change is decreasing zostra. Um, also, the small sample size. So since we only had 19 samples overall, we only had seven for Zostra and then six each for Rupia and Haliduli. And then also hydrology. So these crabs are being brought in by the waves and by the tides. So they don't really have much choice in what habitats they settle in. So it may be that they're just happened to be blown more into Rupia and Haliduli than Zostra. Then for the habitat richness, um, we did find that higher richness possibly meant more, uh, more crabs um, because of this more structural complexity. But again, the, the p-value was not really significant, um, but it could be with more sampling. And then finally, no correlation between the shoot density and crab abundance. And that may be because a greater driver of abundance is the distance from the inlet um, because they're being blown in and they don't really have a choice. So after doing this, um, this project, it really highlighted the need for seagrass preservation and restoration, uh, specifically that more seagrass is better. So there might not be a correlation between certain species or densities of seagrass, but it would just benefit these crabs to have a lot of seagrass everywhere, as well as continued monitoring of habitat composition. So um, with climate change, it might mean that Zostra will continue to decline in quality um, and we are not sure whether or not that will correlate with an increase in Haliduli rupia and how that could affect the crab abundance. And then finally, just general continued sampling of crab abundance to add to the data that um, I looked at to see if more data points means higher correlations. And so I'd like to thank my mentor, Erin Voigt, uh, that's her doing the suction sampling in that photograph, and her mentor, Dr. Dave Eggleston, um, Dr. Erin McKenney for putting this all together, and my 
lab partners, Alyssa Quackenbush and Lydia Bjorklund, and um, to you guys, to the viewers. And with that, uh, any questions? Awesome. Thank you so much, Annika. If you could stop sharing your screen and then let's see. Um, again, this is the point where we would love to have any questions uh, through the Q&A feature. If you want to type those in or if you want to raise your hand, I can um, kind of call on you and unmute you. I think we have time for one question before we need to move on. there's no deadline for the Q&A feature. So if something percolates, please feel free attendees, type those questions in and our presenters can answer them uh, in type. All right, well, up next, we have Sasha Pereira as senior in zoology. So Sasha, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen. All righty, let's see. Can you all see this? Yes, perfect. Awesome, thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Sasha Pereira. I am a senior majoring in zoology. And this semester I have been working on a project to develop a clearing and staining protocol for fishes. And so I'd like to start by talking about the role that biological collections can play in ecological research. And I'm sure that many of us are familiar with those big rooms full of jars that you might see at a science museum. Um, but these collections can also exist at a smaller scale at educational institutions like colleges and universities. And these are often used for um, teaching or educational purposes. So these collections can be used for a variety of, or can be used to answer a variety of research questions as well. Um, for example, you might be able to determine the historic range of a species, since most collected specimens come with um, tags or labels that indicate where they were found. Um, with collected species, you can also um, run tissue and genetic analyses to assess how closely related two different species are, in addition to conducting your basic anatomical and physiological queries. So there's a lot of uses for these collections. And so when we talk about looking at the external anatomy of a collected specimen, it's typically fairly simple and straightforward, um, and you don't really need any kind of fancy or specialized equipment. But unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case if you want to look at the internal structures of an organism. And so some of the most common methods that are still used today, such as X-ray and CT scans and dissection, do tend to come with quite a few drawbacks. So with X-ray and CT scanning, while you do um, end up with high resolution images, which is great, they're often pretty costly and it's hard to gain access to that kind of equipment unless you work within or in close proximity to a medical facility. And then with dissection, um, all you really need is a knife and maybe some scissors and forceps, um, but it does tend to ruin the integrity of a specimen. And so once you cut it open, you can't return it back into its original form. This is especially problematic when you're working with a species where you might only have one or two representatives. And so if you damage one of those um, individuals, you could potentially lose out on a lot of data that you can't get back. And so a solution to these challenges lies within the process of diaphanization, which is also known as clearing and staining. So diaphanization involves a series of chemical reactions that turn the skin and tissues of an organism translucent, in addition to staining the bones red and the cartilage blue. And so some of the, some of the benefits of this method um, include that one, um, uh, it, the integrity of the specimens tends to remain intact, as you can see from the below images, and two, the chemicals involved are relatively inexpensive compared to what you would need to pay for an X-ray or CT scan. Um, it also has many uses. And if you have access to multiple life stages of a species, you could potentially use diaphanization to study its developmental biology. Or maybe if your research questions are more so geared towards um, studying when certain morphological traits appeared or how a certain joint structure works, um, diaphanization can be used to answer questions about evolutionary biology and biomechanics as well. And so the actual procedure for query and staining is pretty interesting because it takes that whole organism that you see on the left and it transforms it into the image that you see on the right. And so I've listed a few of the major steps below. Um, so as soon as you obtain your specimen, you first want to fix it in formaldehyde, which will stop it from falling apart and it'll help to preserve the tissue throughout the rest of the procedure. After that, you're gonna dehydrate the specimen in a series of ethanol baths before moving it into a blue dye solution to stain the cartilage. Um, 
From there, you're going to move the specimen into a trypsin bath um, to initiate the clearing process. And so trypsin is an enzyme that helps to digest proteins. And at this stage, the specimen should be about 50% translucent. Um, next, you move it into a red dye solution to stain the bones before returning it back into that trypsin bath um, to finish out the clearing process. And so depending on the size of the specimen, this procedure can take anywhere from three weeks to over an entire year. So it is quite a lengthy procedure. And so there are a number of papers that describe the general procedure of clearing and staining, but the one that's probably the most well known was published by Taylor and Van Dyke in 1985. And so our goal for this uh, project was to develop a formal inquiry-based protocol for teleost for bony fishes based on that paper that can then be incorporated into undergraduate and graduate fisheries courses. So we chose to focus on teleost fishes um, because they are the most diverse group of vertebrates on the planet, uh, which is pretty cool. And there's also high species diversity, even among species that are pretty small in size. And so these smaller sizes are ideal for instructional laboratory classes um, because they're easier to transport and store. And so as much fun as it would be to give every student a shark to do this procedure on, that would just not be logistically feasible. And so our original plan um, at the beginning of the semester was to conduct experimental trials using tilapia and striped bass at the Lake Lure Fish Barn. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> those plans were disrupted by the pandemic, as I'm sure there were for many people. And um, our supplies did not arrive until two months after they were supposed to. And so at the beginning of the semester, um, we had to make the decision to switch to plan B. And so I ended up conducting a literature review and cross-referencing that Taylor and Van Dyke paper with other clearing and staining papers um, with the intention of trying to eliminate any ambiguity or discrepancies between the procedural steps. As for our final products, um, so first we have a student protocol or a protocol for students in future biology of fishes laboratory classes, um, which has the course number AEC442. And so this protocol contains your typical experimental information, such as background information on the procedure itself and what it's used for, any safety hazards that students may encounter, um, the materials that are used, the anticipated timeline, as well as a description of the actual procedural steps as well. We also decided to include a photo series assignment. And so students will be required to take pictures at various stages throughout the clearing and staining process. And then at the end of the experiment, they're gonna use those photos to create a clearing and staining index. And so that's so students will have the opportunity to practice both collecting and analyzing qualitative and quantitative data. And then lastly, we decided to include an inquiry-based component, um, and what that will look like involves students developing a hypothesis at the beginning of the semester, um, and then testing it and running the rest of the scientific method throughout the procedure. Um, and then finally, um, the second product is an instructor's edition of the protocol with additional notes and guidelines. And so the image on the right um, is a draft protocol that I put together, and I'm currently working on reformatting it into more of a worksheet-style document for students. As for our next steps, um, now that our supplies have finally arrived, we plan to use those to conduct experimental trials over the summer at the Lake Lure Fish Barn. And depending on how those trials go, we may need to refine the protocol and conduct um, additional trials. And so our ultimate goal is to hopefully implement this protocol in the biology of fishes lab class in the fall semester. And this will definitely be an iterative process. And so depending on how that semester goes, we may end up refining the protocol some more for um, before we implement it in future classes. In terms of areas for future research, um, there is a bit of ambiguity in the literature about how well larger specimens go through the process or how long it takes them to do so. Um, and that's important to know if you're working within a specific time, um, time frame. Uh, you can also look at how well different species or families go through the procedure, like we were hoping to do originally with the tilapia and the striped bass. And then a third area is best practices for specimen preparation. So an example of this could be whether or not removing the scales of the fish has any impact on how well it goes through the procedure or what the final end product would be. Um, so I, I would imagine that, for example, a species like a gar, which has ganoid scales, um, which are very tough and thick and are basically like a suit of armor, you would almost certainly need to remove those. Um, otherwise, the other chemicals just wouldn't be able to penetrate the skin. But that might not necessarily be the case for something like a striped bass, which has like thinner tenoid scales. Um, so with, for all of their flexibility and support throughout the semester, I'd like to thank Dr. Ben Reading in the Department of Applied Ecology, um, as well as PhD student Linnea Anderson and Joseph Bercy, who is the lab and facility manager at the Lake Lure Fish Farm. And I think Linnea deserves an extra shout out for having to answer all of my late night emails. So thank you, Linnea. 
Um, I'd also like to thank the Office of Undergraduate Research for funding part of this project and the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences for donating specimens to us. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sasha. This is our chance to tune back into the Q&A tool. People are a little, a little shy with their typing this afternoon. Oh, we do have, let's see, like someone has raised their hand perhaps. Annika, Annika's raised their hand. <laughs> you wanna go ahead and unmute and ask your question? Sure, yeah. So first of all, great job, Sasha. That was really interesting. Um, so did you find, when you were conducting this literature review, did you find any like noticeable differences between how different people did this process? Or was it all generally kind of the same? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think for the most part, the steps were pretty much the same, or at least in the same order. I did find one paper that was a little questionable um, that involved staining the bone before staining the cartilage, which I was a little bit on the fence about. Um, I would think that bone would be harder to stain than cartilage. And so I think that's why the procedure typically calls for initiating the clearing process before you begin staining the bone. Um, but for the most part, they were relatively the same. Thank you. And you've got some fan mail in the Q&A. Thanks, Thanks again, Sasha. <laughs> um, up next, we have Kate Mills, a senior in statistics. Kate, do you want to share your screen? Good to go. Yes, perfect. Okay, so hi everyone. Again, I am Kate Mills, a major in statistics and obviously a minor in applied ecology. And this semester I did my research on occupancy modeling of the Noose River water dog under increasing threats. So going into some background about what is the Noose River water dog, the Noose River water dog is a fully aquatic salamander that is endemic to the Tar Pamlico and Noose River basins, and thus can only be found in North Carolina. For those of you who aren't as familiar with the river basins in North Carolina, Raleigh is located in the Noose River basin, which runs all the way to the Pamlico Sound out in the east, and the Tar Pamlico River Basin sits directly north of the Noose River basin and also ends up in the Pamlico Sound. Um, in the past, the water dog has been found in major tributaries and streams across the Piedmont and coastal plain regions of North Carolina. So this would be the middle and easternmost parts of the state. And this species preferred habitat is non-polluted, calm moving streams. They live on the bottom of these streams and can most commonly be found in leaf beds, mud banks, or under larger rocks. This is a carnivorous species that does most of its hunting at night along the bottom of the streams and is more active in the cooler months. So one major issue for the Noose River water dog is that it has not been widely studied. There is limited research that has been done and many questions about the water dog still remain. One thing that can be determined from previous research is that the water dog is very susceptible to changes in stream quality. So human activities around river basins and streams that the water dog lives in can cause a buildup of silt in our waterways, which can be detrimental to the health of water dogs, which is also known as siltation. Stream alterations, which can be made by humans or beavers, can also fragment a water dog's habitat. And any shift in water quality can also reduce the amount of adequate habitat for the species. Shifts in water quality can be caused by pollution, changes in agriculture, cultural activities or erosion that gets into these streams. These activities can lead to increases in phosphorus or nitrogen in our streams and can cause many other harmful effects such as algae blooms. The water dogs really just require a very delicate balance of stream chemistry. So some background on my project more specifically, PhD student Eric Tetsworth at NC State has begun to look into and study the occupancy and abundance of these water dogs in North Carolina. He went out and sampled 116 stream sites over eight days, which actually took around two years to collect all the data. But for this, most of the sites were being studied only four out of eight days, so they were sampled over four days. And then for each, day that a site was sampled, the stream conditions were recorded and the presence of absence of water dogs were recorded. He is also being funded by NCWRC and the US Fishing and Wildlife Service. Um, for each of these sites, there were 14 site and observation covariates that were recorded. Site covariates are things that would affect if a water dog might live at a site like the phosphorus levels and observation covariates are 
things that would affect like was Eric able to find and identify a water dog if it actually does live at this site. So these 14 covariates are listed on this slide. They include the latitude and longitude of the site. There were five land use land cover variables that were recorded. So this is like the proportion of developed land around the site, the proportion of wetlands around the site, things like that. Each site was also given a benthic rating, a channel stability assessment. The phosphorus and nitrogen loads at the site were recorded. And then the max air temperature, min air temperature, and the daily precipitation prior to the night that the trap was set were also recorded. So my research question itself was kind of twofold. I wanted to look at what does the current distribution of water dogs look like? And then looking forward, we know that environmental conditions are always changing. So can we use a developed model to see what the future distribution of water dogs is going to look like if we manipulate some of these variables in the model? So to do that, I fit an occupancy model to study which environmental factors, if any, had the largest effect on the current distribution of water dogs. And then I was gonna use this model to make predictions about what the future of the water dog is going to look like. So I chose to do occupancy modeling because it allowed me to account for imperfect detection of water dogs. So what this basically means is, for example, if a site was studied for four days and on days one, three, and four, a water dog was found and on day two, it wasn't. We assume this means that there's imperfect detection and the water dog was probably there on day two, but was just not actually found in the samples. So from there, in order to select a model, I used our programming. I read in and scaled the data. And then I decided to add quadratic terms for the minimum air, the maximum air, precipitation variables, as well as phosphorus, nitrogen, and benthic, because previous research suggests that there might be a more complex relationship between occupancy and these variables. I did then did some exploratory data analysis and found that in my model, I had a couple correlated variables and limited data. So for these models that I was fitting, I wasn't able to use variables that were correlated. So I had to fit a bunch of different models for every combination. So basically like I fit a model that had developed land max air nitrogen and then like developed land max air phosphorus. And so for every combination of all those things. So this was 20 models. Um, I couldn't fit models with these correlated variables because adding correlated variables adds bias to the estimates of uncertainty in the model. So after fitting all these prelim preliminary models for these combinations, I did model comparison and found that all of the models that fit phosphorus instead of nitrogen were much better at predicting occupancy. But other than that, it was very unclear which other variables had a big effect on occupancy. So I decided to focus just on the 10 phosphorus models. And then from there, as I said, there was no best, like one best clear model. So I decided to use the AIC values assigned to each model, which basically estimates the relative quality of a model to model average over these 10 phosphorus models. And so I could eventually end up with a single model. Model averaging allowed me to account for this model selection uncertainty that I was seeing. So again, to come up with this final model, average model over the best fitting models, um, I used all the models that had a Delta AIC of less than four. When we model average, the estimates for each covariate are weighted by the amount of support they have. So I ended up with this 20 term model and you can see the covariates over there in the table on the right. And for each covariate, you can see it's estimate and 95% confidence interval. Highlighted in blue are the variables that were significant. So this would be the intercept, benthic squared, latitude, longitude, phosphorus, and phosphorus squared. And of particular interest to me were these phosphorus values and how they had a clear relationship with occupancy. And so you can see this is a negative quadratic relationship between phosphorus and occupancy because that phosphorus squared value is negative while the phosphorus regular value is positive. So kind of moving into the second part of what I wanted to study, I now wanted to take this model and make predictions because we know that the current values of these predictors in the streams will inevitably change. And when they do, how is this going to affect the occupancy of the water dog? So here I use the range of the phosphorus levels that were seen in the data collected. So that was from about 31 to 261,000 parts per million per kilometer squared. Um, so I ranged over all those variables and then wanted to predict water dog occupancy probability using my developed model. Um, I ranged over those values and I set all the other values in my model to their mean. So this graph at the bottom helps us more clearly see this negative quadratic relationship found between occupancy phosphorus and phosphorus squared. So in this model, um, a negative quadratic relationship kind of means that at a high or low value of phosphorus, there's a low probability of occupancy of the water dog at a site, 
but I found this kind of optimum range, which you can see here marked by the red lines that occurs from about 31,000 to 120,000 parts per million kilometer squared of phosphorus, where the occupancy probability is greater than 50%. So this is kind of like the optimum range of phosphorus levels you want to see in your streams to for a water dog to be able to have this as like a suitable habitat. So then looking at this kind of more spatially, this slide shows the current distribution of the occupancy of water dogs at the time the data was collected. So each dot is one of the 116 survey sites. Light blue indicates that water dogs were found and dark blue indicates that a water dog was not found at these sites. So we can already see kind of in places with a lot of developed land. So probably lots of phosphorus such as Wake County kind of here in the top left area. Um, there were barely any water dogs found at all. And then looking forward, I wanted to fit this hypothetical scenario. Um, so I set the values to range from the mean of phosphorus levels that were found, and then I, they went up to increased phosphorus levels, which was about 400,000 parts per million per kilometer squared. So I wanted to look at just like what increased phosphorus levels would do to the amount of water dogs and the suitable habitat they have. So this is hypothetical, but like what to focus on in this image is really we can clearly observe that there are a lot less light blue sites than there were on the last slide. So in conclusion, um, from the data was that, collect, that was collected, we can make predictions based on phosphorus, phosphorus squared, latitude, longitude, and benthic score, which were the significant variables that were found in my best fit model. We can also see that phosphorus levels and water dog occupancy have a clear negative quadratic relationship, and having phosphorus levels that were too high or too low can drive down water dog occupancy probability. And then looking forward, a focus on the management of point and non-point sources of phosphorus discharge is necessary to help preserve water dog populations so they can have this suitable habitat. Um, I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Krishna Pacifica for being such a great mentor. I learned so much this semester. He was so great to work with. And do you have any questions? Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. See, I don't see any questions in the Q&A feature yet, but maybe we'll get something rolling in. Also, again, reminding our attendees that you're welcome to raise your hand and our other panelists too. And we've got one from Eric. So Eric, I'm gonna unmute you so you can ask your own question, okay? Perfect. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right, Kate, that was uh, that was excellent. Um, great job. Um, I I guess so. The first thing that I want to ask is, um, yeah, you found that the quadratic relationship with phosphorus was, um, you know, was was found in your in your model, and I'm curious. Do you think that there is a lower bound? for threshold meaning like or sorry lower bound for that like phosphorus so like there is a scenario where there's not enough phosphorus in the stream or do you think that's just an artifact of the fact that like essentially all of these streams have some level of phosphorus input um, and there's some sort of tolerance to that which is maybe in the middle um, but as you approach you know yeah so wh what do you think like, what do you think is the, the reality of this? Um, great question and thank you. I feel like, um, I feel like there's, I feel like there's probably a lower bound, but I feel like the lower bound isn't really going to affect water dogs just because there's so much activity going on, like around streams in the New Centaur River Basins. I just feel like there's not ever going to be like, zero phosphorus or anything or like not enough phosphorus going into the stream for it actually to affect the water dogs habitat or for like it really to be easily studied to see like is there actually a lower bound um I just feel like with all of the erosion and human activities there's always going to be some phosphorus so I feel like there is but even if there's not I feel like there's always going to be enough phosphorus that it wouldn't super affect a water dog's habitat if that makes sense yeah it does it does yeah thank you Anna, great job again. And Kate, you have a question in the Q&A from Brad Taylor, if you wanna 
answer that live? Um, yes, hold on a second. So, Brad, um, good question. The units um, are kind of, and like phosphorus itself is kind of just an indirect way to study the effects of kind of like some other things that are going on. So basically when there's phosphorus, there could be algae blooms that come from that. And also just like the amount of it could mean like it's disturbed or kind of like a bunch of different things could be happening in the stream when there's increased phosphorus. So I feel like it's kind of a combination of a bunch of things, but then it does like, because it's a combination of a bunch of things, it still does directly have that impact on the occupancy. And then the units are parts per million per kilometer squared, not milligrams per liter. So it was measured in the sediment, not in the water. The sediment like at the bottom of the streams. Does that answer your question? He's responded, so it's a proxy. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. Great job. And if anyone has any additional questions percolating up, um, feel free to continue that conversation in the Q&A feature. Um, next, we'll hear from Cassidy Davis, a senior in zoology. Awesome, thank you guys. Can somebody nod and tell me that they can see this in the presentation screen and not yes. just the edit? Awesome. Thank you. So my project is looking at factors influencing the gut microbiome of American martens and fishers. And these are both two native North American mustelids. And the factors that I was taking a look at in this project were specifically species, sex, and gastrointestinal tract site, um, and how they influence what bacteria come to dominate the community. So before I even get started, I wanted to acknowledge my research mentor, Dr. Erin McKinney, who has walked with me through every step of this project from coding to interpretation of results, and I could not have done it without her. And same for Dr. Diana Lafferty, who is the principal investigator of the Wildlife Ecology and Conservation Science Lab at Northern Michigan University. She was responsible for collecting the data of this project and assisted in fielding questions about the data set. So she was integral to this as well. So to begin, the gut microbiome is a community of microorganisms inhabiting the gastrointestinal tract that can aid in the host digestion and absorption of nutrients. And in this project, I am specifically looking at the bacteria. So a foundational paper for some of this gut microbiome studies in animals is featured to the right in this figure from Lay et al. 2008's Evolution of Mammals and Their Gut Microbes. So it shows that both diet, especially in the terms of fiber and phylogeny, influence the bacterial diversity in the gut. And they found that from Firmichutes and Bacteriodetes, which are two phyla, made up the majority of the samples and established that as a normal for mammals to have those two bacterial phyla be dominant. Moving on a little bit, it is important to talk about that fiber that I mentioned and how that really shapes the communities of the gut microbiota. So this study looked at gut bacterial colonization from birth in three different species of lemurs and Really what I wanna focus on is these little dashed circles, which are the communities once the host has started eating uh, solid food regularly. So what would be considered their adult diet. And so once that is in place, you can see that the green is in that little circle very tightly and that belongs to the Propithecus cockerelli, which is a highly folivorous species of lemur. And what that is telling you is that the communities of these different um, gut microbiota in the different lemurs are all very related to one another. So they don't 
uh, have a wide range of diversity when compared to the other two species, Verichia variegata and Lemurcata, which consume more fruits and things like that. So as we can see that fiber really constrains what bacteria thrive in the gut because that host needs fiber digesters to survive. So in terms of carnivore studies, wild black bears um, were found to not show significant differences in gut microbiome communities between gut sites or sexes in a very recent study that was actually the first ever done on a carnivore in the wild. Although uh, the term could be a little confusing because bear, black bears are omnivorous creatures, but in the order carnivora. And another order carnivora, uh, fellow, which is a mustelid as well, is the mink. And this captive mink study that is currently in press from Lafferty et al. have found to be sexually dimorphic in their gut microbiota. So it's a little bit of conflicting uh, differences between these two species. So moving forward, my project focuses on the American Martin and Fisher, which are both mustelids. So they're closely related in the same family, and they have similar ecological niches as well. And the aims of my study are to determine interspecifically if there are differences in the gut microbiome communities between the American martens and fishers, and intraspecifically if there are differences in the gut microbiome communities between jejuna and colons, and between females and males. So just to discuss a little more about how closely linked Martins and Fishers are, if you would look at the shaded area on both of these maps, that is the current distribution of these animals. And you can see that there is a high amount of overlap between their natural ranges. And this quote summarizes it very well that I will read it for you. The Fishers and American Martins are the only medium-sized northern predators agile in trees and also elongate and able to explore hollow logs, brush piles, and holes in the ground for prey. So I included that quote just to uh, hammer home the fact that these are two very similar species, which is one of the reasons that they were chosen as the host of interest. And as you can see, they share uh, the similar ecological niches and a similar food web. So they have a highly overlapping food web with the fisher consuming most everything that the marten is known to consume, while also uh, consuming things such as carcasses, fish, and porcupines, which they are known for. So in terms of our data collection, we partnered with hunters in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which is this portion here. Um, and jejunum and colon samples were harvested from 23 different individuals and fecal samples were taken from five live tracked individuals. And fecal samples are a known proxy for colon samples. So they are treated uh, as one and the same. The data was analyzed using 16 rRNA sequencing in the hypervariable V4 region, which is a standard for bacterial community analysis. Uh, paired end reads were used to increase the accuracy of the data coming back from those samples. And we used uh, the Argonne National Labs and the Aluminum MySec platform to achieve our data set. So once that data set was generated from the samples, um, our studio was used both to separate the larger data set into smaller ones that are analyzable and to uh, do statistical analysis as well. So as you can see, this flow chart just kind of shows how it was split into the different categories to adjust uh, to account for my different questions. In terms of data analysis, alpha diversity and beta diversity were both looked at in this study. Richness and Shannon diversity with a significance of 0.05 was looked at for alpha. And then an NMDS plot using Brig Curtis unifract distances was created um, with a, again, a 0.05 significance for beta diversity. And enrichment was looked at as well uh, using a LFC analysis. So do interspecific differences exist between American Martins and Fishers? Initially, it looked like yes. So initially with the raw data set, um, we were seeing that there was a significant differences between the communities. But as you can see, this purple here on our bar graph is all represented by eukaryotes, which is not what we're actually looking at in this study. 
So the next step, of course, was to take out the eukaryotes. And once that was done, you can see both from the bar graph and the results of the NNDS plot that the Martin and Fisher microbiome communities were not statistically significantly different. So next question was, is there a difference between the jejunum and the colon? And again, you can look at this bar graph and on a face level, it looks like there does seem to be some differences, but with a uh, significance of 0 0.05 for all the statistical comparisons, there was not actually any difference between the gut microbiome communities of the uh, jejunum and colon in either the Fisher or the Martin. Although several taxa were enriched in the Martin jejunum, four to be exact, and two in the Martin colon, and three were enriched in the Fisher colon, it was not enough to drive a significant difference between the groups. So moving on, I decided to use only the colon data and look back and see uh, at the question of whether American Martins and Fishers were different because I did not want any biological replicates from the jejunums that were statistically identical to the colons. And even with the colon only data, there was no difference between the Martins and the Fishers with a 0 0.05, uh, again, statistical significance. And as for the final question, are there significant differences between males and females? Uh, the answer is also no, despite the fact that there is some obvious uh, enrichments in both the Martin females and the Fisher females. So the main point for discussion is why am I not seeing any differences between the groups? And what looks like a, a huge contributor to this is the large amount of variation between individuals. So as you can see in this plot of all of the individuals that were sampled, um, there is no set pattern um, to what it means to be a Martin or to be a Fisher or a female or a male in terms of the statistical analyses that we have done. And that looks to be what is driving this. However, a exciting point that this study has made is that colon samples represent the entire gut. And this is the second study after the black bear study to show this, which is super exciting for future research because it is a non-invasive way. So instead of having to collect at three points or two, excuse me, two points, uh, you can only collect fecal sample non-invasively for research. In terms of future directions, um, excluding eukaryotic DNA from amplification is incredibly important, whether that is using 16S with a different primer as uh, suggested in the Hughes et al. 2008 paper. So different primers are better at uh, excluding eukaryotic DNA. And then looking at is a firmishute or a proteobacteria dominant standard for mammalian carnivores, because that is the trend being seen in both the black bear paper and uh, this current research. And then also a question is why is there so much variation between individuals? And a current hypothesis is that they are co-opting the microbiota of their prey. So that is definitely something that will continue to be looked at in the future. Questions? Thank you, Cassidy. Yeah. Um, Again, at this time, if any attendees or panelists would like to raise your hands and ask a question out loud, or feel free to, oh, we have a question in the Q&A. Okay, so to my knowledge, I haven't come across anything um, in these two implying anything about aquatic or terrestrial foods, but that would be something interesting to do a literature search to find maybe on other species. Um, in terms of Fisher, I know it was specifically noted in one of the papers I read that they did not uh, have sexual dimorphism in prey consumption, that they seemed to eat the same amount of things from uh, the same different prey, so. We have another question from an anonymous attendee. So yes, yeah, some um, bacteria in terms, especially looking at what can survive the stomach if it is coming in and they really are co-opting uh, the bacteria of their prey, if they're acid producing bacteria or um, thriving more in acidic community, they do have a uh, better competition 
um, in terms of sticking around longer, but it does not look like it is a main factor for determining the microbiome now. All right. Um, if you have any additional questions for Cassidy, please feel free to keep typing them into the chat and she can field those um, as we move on to our next presenter. Thank you so much, Cassidy. And up next, we have David Poling, a senior in marine sciences. So David, if you'd like to share your screen. All right, hey everybody, I'm David. I'm a student in marine science and applied ecology. And my project is called Budget Drones for Sampling and Monitoring of Surface Water Quality and Algal Growth. So why budget drones? But drones and other unmanned aerial platforms have found use in a whole wide variety of different projects within marine science and ecology. Anything from monitoring habitats to tracking populations to measuring blue whales. The problem with this is that most platforms are upwards of $15,000 to $20,000 once you have them fully equipped with sensors and things. And I wanted to create a package and look into using consumer drones that would allow for labs and citizen science and parks that have much lower budget to do at least initial surveys of different habitats and gather data. So our question was, can a, can a relatively low cost drone with an RGB camera as your only sensor be used to quantitatively and remotely measure algal biomass? And I wanted to discuss the viability of any of this for widespread use. On the bottom right, we have a picture of the drone we use and on the bottom left is just an example of one of the maps that I made during the project. So we had two different parts to our sampling. We had to design a basically an apparatus that could hold tubes and could also be light enough that you could hook it up to the drone, fly it up in the air and use it to collect water. And then we had to use software to basically plan out flights where the drone would go up into the air and make maps that would allow us to look at imagery, would allow us to measure chlorophyll, look at plant health and things like that. Um, and all of these maps were orthorectified. And what that means is basically that if you have a camera looking straight down from the air, the field of view kind of stretches as you go out. And what we do is we use software that basically corrects for this so that the field of view kind of stays even over an entire map and there's no warping. So sampling apparatus, this whole process was interesting. This is a, basically a case study and sometimes the simple, simplest solution is the best. When we initially were planning out the project, I was intending to design something in CAD software and work with 3D printing. We had budgeted for materials to do that. And what we ended up going with was basically a cut out piece of mesh with bobby pins that were attached to fishing wire. And that cost nothing and worked phenomenally well. Um, so here we have two different images. These are both taken from the camera of the drone facing straight down. On the left is basically what I see as I'm lowering tubes into the water. And then on the right, they've hit the water, kind of fallen onto their side. And when I see this, I lower another six inches. The tubes collect water from the surface. And you can take them back up and bring them back. And the method that we developed, you can see there's a carabiner attached right on the bottom of where you see those two little yellow poles come together. And what the carabiners allow us to do is basically once we collect water, we can fly back over, I'll fly back over, and we'll have a second person basically unhook the tubes, unload them, put new tubes back on, and we can go back out and sample more without having to land the entire time until the end of the flight. So the results were multispectral images that allowed for true color measurements and plant health measurements, which was a tool that was in the software we were using, which was called Drone Deploy. And we were also able to capture 24 samples from four different water bodies. There, as you'll see later, there was mixed success with running these samples through different processes, but we were able to um, successfully capture water from all of our stations from a variety of different environments. And on the bottom, you can see a couple of different examples of maps. Um, the left ones are the standard imagery just with the RGB camera. And the right ones were basically run through the plant health tool, which comes with the base subscription of the software you're using that allows for kind of basic chlorophyll reflectance and things like that. 
So with the imagery, one of the biggest issues we came across, and frankly, the thing that if I had more time, I would put probably the most of my effort into fixing was solving an issue with glare that we had, which is basically where as light from the sun is hitting the water, it gets refracted and bounces off the waves. And it's kind of like if you have smudgy sunglasses, it makes your images very streaky and unclear. You can see on the bottom, that's a map of Falls Lake a portion of Falls Lake and you can see as the drone was flying back and forth mapping, you can see it just got really, really streaky along that flight path. And on top, if you look very carefully, um, you can see there's also a bit of a boxed shaped kind of a glare streaking. But um, the reason I included the top one is because it's an example of even though you do have a decent amount of glare in that map, you can still take a lot of strong conclusions from it. For example, if you look very carefully, coming basically to the upper left off of that little island. You can see there's a sediment plume kind of dragging off of that. And that shows up very well in that heat map on the right. So you can still get a lot from these glare maps as long as they're not like terrible like the one on the bottom. But that was kind of a challenge that we had to work through that did end up compromising some of our data. But it was uh, definitely something to note though. <laughs> so this was one of my personal favorite applications of the data we collected. When you run it through the software and it builds these maps, it generates KML files. And KML files can be directly overlaid onto Google Earth, which allows you to kind of build. You can kind of stitch them together and build pictures. It also allows you to map out where your stations are and map out sampling locations relative to different takeoff spots and all sorts of other things. The cool thing is if you look around the map in the water and the base Google Earth data, the base Landsat data, you can see that the resolution's pretty low. There's not a lot of differentiation in the kind of color of the water. And then when you move into the map that we created, you can see that there's a lot more detail when it comes to shading and sediment and different areas that are more green than other areas. That allows for analysis there. So we processed our water samples in a couple different ways. The first way was with fluorometry, which is basically you have a machine that shines a light onto your sample and it measures reflectance to measure chlorophyll. And measuring chlorophyll is kind of an analog for biomass for how many cells, how many photosynthetic cells you have in a particular sample of water. Um, so we had three stations, three, sorry, three sites that we were able to successfully measure chlorophyll from. And chlorophyll is one of the main metrics that is used when looking for impaired water, which basically means that there is a possibility of there being too much biomass, which isn't necessarily a huge red flag, but it definitely should catch the attention of people who are in management and things like that to go back there and say, okay, there could be an excess of toxic cyanobacteria or something similar. We were able to identify Falls Lake as definitely qualifying as impaired waters. The uh, thresholds about 40 micrograms per liter. The Falls Lake stations were at 63 and 92. One of the stations at High Rock edged a little bit above. Um, if I was able to go out for a second season, I'd want to reinvestigate that body. Um, but it was still cool to be able to kind of come to some of these conclusions with the data that we collected. The next data processing method we used was flow cytometry. Basically, what flow cytometry does is it runs a water sample cell by cell across a laser. And that allows you to gather basic metrics like size and shape and reflect reflectance of different photosynthetic pigments and things like that. On the left, there's an example of what raw flow cytometry data looks like. And you can take all sorts of conclusions from it. For example, um, cells that are higher up on the y-axis, you can see that yellow reflectance are more likely to have certain accessory pigments like Focosan, and then there's all sorts of different things you can do with that. On the right, we have a graph of cell counts by type and by station. You can see there's a whole handful of phyto phytoplankton cell counts and fewer bacterial cell counts. I would have liked to do more comparison of the two. Unfortunately, we lost a couple bacteria samples just as we were doing the pro project. Um, there were still some interesting correlations I found between the two, but given the number of samples, I wasn't comfortable putting them in my presentation and pretending that I had like a concrete statistical correlation. Um, but it was still cool to be able to get counts, compare them to um, 
chlorophyll concentration and things like that. So the conclusion is that our package, I mean, it required no special equipment. The whole thing cost under $1,500, which if you look at a lot of commercial UAV sampling packages and drone setups with different cameras, as I said, you're usually at least in five figures or higher. Um, so it was really cool to be able to go back with just consumer equipment that anybody could pick up, that any lab that either has a low budget or just doesn't want to allocate a lot of resources, anybody in citizen science who may be a hobbyist is able to pick up a lot of this equipment and go out and try different things. Um, the drone deploy, the subscription for the software we were using was only about $100 a month, which is very economical compared to a lot of other options. We were able to successfully measure and analyze algal biomass. Um, when I was looking through some of the raw flow cytometry data, I was able to find signatures of different types of bacteria and phytoplankton that we were already fairly certain were in these areas anyways. So that was kind of reassuring to see. Um, and I think that personally, my favorite part besides the flying um, a pilot at heart was definitely kind of creating some of the maps and get, get being able to play with those in Google Earth and kind of lay all that out. Um, if I had a chance to do further effort with this project, I think the two things I would focus on was A, would be just working on the glare reduction. Um, there's a whole, there's a handful of resources already available for kind of post-processing and setting up your camera in a certain way to reduce glare. Um, and then depth sampling. One of the biggest limitation factors of using these budget drones are that they're very small and they're not really meant to carry any significant payload. So having an apparatus that samples the surface is very easy. You just dip tubes and then the water kind of just flows in. But having an apparatus that you can lower into the water to a given depth that usually requires weights and more mechanical things to make sure that their bottles open up at the right depths, it's very complicated. You can see that image on the bottom. It's a hydro sleeve, which was, it was basically an example of a depth sampling apparatus. And you can see it's about six feet long. And the drones we were using were not much bigger than my head. So they are not really capable of carrying something like that. But I think it would be really interesting, maybe a kind of a cooperative study with somebody in engineering to try to develop smaller depth, depth sampling techniques. I would like to thank first and foremost, Dr. Ryan Pearl at uh, Marine Science here at NC State. He's been a huge influence for me and a huge mentor, not only in this project, but honestly for my entire undergraduate experience and an absolutely fantastic mentor. And William Reckling, who's a PhD student and a teaching assistant here in Marine Science. He also works with the Center for Geospatial Analytics. He's kind of our uh, local drone ants kind of mapping expert. He taught me how to do a lot of the drone deploy map creation, taught me all the little intricate settings that you use to set up the flights properly. Um, it was he and his family who actually did a lot of the development for the sampling apparatus we used. So it's generally all, overall some uh, great guys who I feel very privileged to have been able to work with. Those are my sources. And if we have any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, David. And to our attendees, you know what I'm gonna say now, if you would like to raise your hand, um, I'm happy to unmute you so you can ask your question live. Otherwise, feel free to type in to the Q&A feature. And we have sure. Daniel With, yeah. Curtis. Okay. I can go back to the flow cytometry slides. So these are basically measuring reflectance, fluorescence in different colors. Um, so you have a, for example, the red B, there's a whole slew of different kind of axis you can use. Um, but my understanding is that you have the red B and the yellow B. So basically this is a blue laser and that's that second B part. And these are the colors that you're measuring the fluorescence of. So um, you could have green, you can measure 
You can also measure scatter off of the laser, laser which kind of can be equivalent to size and things like that. Um, but overall though, yes, the red and the yellow are basically just measuring how intensely those are fluoresced back. Thanks, and Nathaniel, I have given you permission to speak if you would like to ask your question live. Awesome, yeah, thanks. Good job, David. Um, just wanted to ask a general question. With the budget setup you had um, compared to some of the higher tech cameras that might be out on the market, do you think it would be possible to use the amount of pigment that you get from a direct image at this point to look at not only chlorophyll levels, but maybe the accessory pigments? Is that something attainable with the setup you used or would you need something a little fancier? I would say that I would say that you probably could. I would th I could tell you that cameras that are more specialized for specific bands are probably better if you're going to get really specific about what you're measuring. But overall, though, if it's within the visible light spectrum, which obviously most accessory pigments are, you are able to measure it at least to a degree with just an RGB camera. Well, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Nathaniel. Well, thank you again, David. Um, again, oh, and you have one more question in the Q&A. Um, so the tubes, this is, <laughs> this is these tubes actually float. So basically when they hit the water, we did, I did a handful of trial runs with a small pool just in my yard, just to kind of see how low they go. And the tubes are about, I would say, an inch across. So as they hit the water, they sink to about the top of the tube when it's laying on its side to about the top of the tube. So basically you're measuring within the first inch of the water and they won't sink any lower than that without weights. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, David. If you could uh, stop sharing your screen. Perfect. Um, Next, we'll hear from Shiana Basham, a senior in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation ecology. All right, thank you, Erin. Um, I'm excited to share my research today with you all on the impacts of lanthanum-based materials on freshwater benthic dwelling organisms. Okay, now before we can dive into the project, we need to talk about eutrophication. In this picture, you can see a lake that probably looks pretty similar to a lot of lakes or ponds that you've seen, especially in the Raleigh area, but this lake is not healthy. All freshwater systems rely on nitrogen and phosphorus to function properly, but the ratio of those two nutrients is key to determining the health of that system. Industrial agriculture and increased human populations can cause extra nutrients to enter a lake or pond through runoff. If there are too many nutrients, things can get bad quickly. Um, so these extra nutrients can result in harmful algal blooms, increased turbidity or cloudiness in the water, fish kills, and can even be deadly to humans and other terrestrial animals like our pets. Because of these effects, a lot of work has gone into trying to stop eutrophication from occurring. The most effective way to stop eutrophication would be to stop runoff from farms, cities, yards, and other areas, but that isn't always possible. Also, phosphorus is stored in the sediments, so reducing current nutrient inputs can still result in eutrophication if the lake or pond has experienced nutrient loading in the past. For many years, scientists have been developing new materials that can be added to water in order to stop eutrophication from occurring. Traditionally, these were compounds like iron or aluminum oxides, but these can be tricky to use in the field and can have negative effects on organisms. A new material known cleverly as phoslock consists of lanthanum modified bentonite and was developed in the year 2000. In the bottom image, you can see two water bodies side by side. The one on the right did not receive a phoslock treatment and looks very green and murky, while the one on the left has been treated with phoslock and looks much healthier. Phoslock or other lanthanum based materials are typically applied evenly to the surface of a lake or pond. As the material travels through the water column, it essentially grabs on to any phosphate that is floating in the water. 
The lanthanum then settles onto the sediments where it remains active until almost all of the lanthanum has attached to phosphate, at which point the phosphate is no longer available to algae. While lanthanum is generally considered safe, there is a lot we don't know about the effects that lanthanum might have on organisms that live on or in sediments and are in closest proximity to any materials that settle there. The image shown here depicts the focus of the study where lanthanum-based materials have reached the bottom of a eutrophic lake and shows some of the organisms we might expect to find there, like crustaceans, mollusks, and gastropods. The main objective of this project was to conduct a comprehensive literature review of peer-reviewed publications that reported on ecological risks of lanthanum-based materials on benthic dwelling organisms in freshwater systems. From this literature review, I hoped to identify key risk factors to benthic dwelling organisms, including properties of lanthanum materials, as well as environmental conditions that may increase risk. This information was then discussed in a written report that described the background use of lanthanum-based materials, potential ecological impacts on sediment dwelling organisms, as well as main research gaps in current literature. Based on the properties of lanthanum in relevant ecotoxicity literature, two hypotheses were formed. First, I expected that lanthanum would act differently under different environmental conditions and that there would be varied impacts to organisms. Second, I expected acute lethal toxic, toxic effects to be low that there could be more significant long-term effects from elevated lanthanum concentrations within organisms. Relevant literature was found using the NC State Library database. So this literature was then categorized as either highly relevant, moderately relevant, or somewhat relevant. And this relevancy was determined based on the specific form of lanthanum studied and the organisms used in the study and certain environmental factors. Key themes were then extracted, and these included the study type, test species, study duration, water quality parameters, the form of lanthanum used in the study, the quantity of lanthanum applied, effects measured in the study, and key observations extracted from the report. This data is summarized on the next two slides. Now, I know this is a lot of information, but I will point out some of the main findings in this moment. All of the information portrayed here is from the highly and moderately relevant studies of which six were highly relevant and three were moderately relevant. This table shows all of the somewhat relevant literature of which there were seven studies. Most of these were general ecotoxicity studies and did not focus on benthic dwelling organisms. From those two tables, I extracted five key findings. First, it seems clear that lanthanum can be bioavailable and taken up by organisms. However, uptake rates are species specific and accumulation can vary by tissue sampled. Second, lanthanum does not appear to be acutely toxic unless applied at high concentrations. And what we consider to be a high concentration can vary based on the organism in question and specific environmental factors. The third key finding was that lanthanum can accumulate into the organism's tissues rather quickly with the rate of accumulation again being species dependent. These elevated lanthanum levels can take a long time to leave the body and appear to persist across generations. This could become particularly concerning if lanthanum is applied multiple times to one lake, and there were very few long-term studies to understand how these concentrations might change over time. Fourth, lanthanum may be safer to use in moderate to hard water systems, which means that the water has higher levels of calcium carbonate. This is because calcium and phosphorus have similar atomic radii and lanthanum is attracted to both, and thus there is less free lanthanum available to organisms. Finally, studies on marine benthic invertebrates and daphnia show that there do appear to be physi physiological effects of elevated lanthanum concentrations, including metabolic changes, neurotoxicity, decreases in reproductive fitness, and decreases in overall size and weight. However, these effects varied across studies and may have been exa exaggerated by some environmental factors. Now you might be wondering what all of this means. With only six highly relevant studies and an additional 10 studies with moderate to low relevancy, it is difficult to determine any specific factors that might make the use of lanthanum more risky under different environmental conditions or to different organisms. It does not appear that the use of lanthanum under normal management applications will result in significant short-term ecological impacts. However, there could be organisms that are more sensitive that weren't studied. 
Organisms that showed physiological changes were Daphnia, which is a model organism in ecotoxicity literature, which is shown here in the bottom right, and saltwater mussels shown in the bottom left. We know that the effects of lanthanum can be exaggerated under saltwater conditions. However, most studies focused solely on the bioavailability of lanthanum, and few studies focused on the effects of lanthanum on the organisms. Therefore, we do not know what the long-term physiological effects of lanthanum will be on other benthic dwelling organisms. While lanthanum-based materials appear to be promising as phosphorus capturing tools, there is still much we do not know about its effects on freshwater organisms. Future research should include a larger diversity of organisms, again, because it is clear that responses of, to lanthanum are species specific. This research should also investigate the effects of lanthanum under different environmental conditions to identify the key risk factors that are largely missing from current literature. Future research should also try to assess how climate change might impact the relationship between lanthanum and freshwater organisms as varying and more extreme precipitation events and temperature patterns could disrupt our current understandings of the issue. I would like to thank Dr. Kara Grieger for her supervision, guidance, and support throughout this project. And I would also like to thank Dr. Alonzo Ramirez for reviewing the results of this study with his expertise in aquatic macroinvertebrates. I'm now happy to take any questions that anyone might have about this project. Awesome, thanks so much, Shayana. And now is the time, yeah, attendees or panelists, if any of you would like to raise your hand, I can unmute you to ask your question live or take advantage of that Q&A feature. For some reason, my mouse currently isn't working, um, so I cannot see the question that is currently in the oh, Q&A. <laughs> I can ask it for you. Um, it's okay. from Kara Grieger, who you might know. Um, <laughs> she said, thanks, Shiana. Uh, just curious, what surprised you most about these findings? Um, I think I was really just surprised how little information there is that exists on the, this material. Uh, there was uh, some statistics from FOSLOC stating that this material has been used in over 200 water bodies. Uh, but again, there were only uh, 16 studies that I was able to find on benthic dwelling organisms. Uh, and I'm sure that this, that this uh, material has been used in other applications. So it, it was just sort of surprising to see um, how little was known and yet it's, it's still being used um, without understanding the full effects of this material. Awesome. And Kara had another question. Is there any comparative data, um, for example, between landinum versus iron, uh, since iron is also used under these types of applications? Um, I did not see any that were specifically comparing the two. Um, I'm sure that they may exist, uh, especially in, in other organisms. I know that there are more studies relating to fish and plants. So there may, may have been other studies that were comparing iron and lanthanum and, uh, with other organisms, but not that I was able to find uh, for benthic dwelling organisms. Thanks, and we've just had clarification. That wasn't the real Kara Grieger. It must have been a Zoom cat or somebody posing as Kara uh -oh. asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, Jacob Jones. All right, well, thanks again, Shiana. Um, if you wouldn't mind, yeah, perfect. We'll make this transition. Um, let's see. Up next, we'll hear from Heather Mounier, a senior in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Oh, no. Okay, 
sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you for being here today. I'm going to be presenting on the statistical analysis that I completed for data that was collected from 2008 and 2009 by the Irwin Lab of Entomology here at NC State. Um, hopefully you're familiar with the term urbanization. In essence, urbanization is when people shift from living in a more rural setting to a more developed, densely populated setting in which, um, which require large tracts of land to be cleared for development. Um, the global population is growing and the UN predicts that by 2030, the population will reach upwards of 8.5 billion people with an estimated 5 billion people living in major cities. Um, so this will undoubtedly result in the further expansion of urbanized areas, which may result in continued loss of critical habitat for wildlife. As essential habitat is lost to clear a pathway um, in the name of human progress, urbanization poses a major threat to biodiversity here on Earth. So arthropods make up roughly 90% of the animal kingdom with more than 1.2 million described species inhabiting all seven continents. They're a widely diverse group of organisms that play a pivotal role in maintaining the ecological balance across all ecosystems. Um, the effects of urbanization is a really hot topic in conservation research and has been widely studied for many species of birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Um, with the exception of our charismatic pollinators like bees and butterflies, the effects of urbanization on arthropods and more specifically the ground dwelling arthropods is not really well understood. And this is alarming because recent studies have been found um, that overall that there is an overall decline in several arthropod populations. However, these results vary depending on the study. And so there's a definite need for more work to assess the general pattern. Um, as urban sprawl continues, this lack of understanding of how urbanization affects ground dwelling arthropods may be haphazardly decimating this lower trophic level, which could trigger a major trophic cascade uh, that we as humanity are unprepared to face. So our aim was to compare species richness and abundance between urban and non-urban sites to gain a better understanding of whether or not ground dwelling arthropods are being negatively impacted by urbanization. And if any significant difference was found, what specific co confounding factors associated with urbanization may be driving this difference in the arthropod community composition. So my hypothesis was that urbanization is having a negative impact on ground dwelling arthropods. Although because some orders of insects have a tendency to adapt a little bit better and exploit available resources, I thought that this impact might be order specific and some orders would be impacted more than others. I predicted that species richness and relative abundance would be higher in the non-urban sites um, and that plant community composition and ground cover would have the greatest influence on arthropod community composition if we did find any significant difference between urban and non-urban sites. So the study was conducted here in Wake County um, it's nestled within a temperate deciduous forest and is undergoing one of the fastest urbanization rates in the US. As a growing community, green space and un undeveloped areas still exist among the moderate to high density developments that are being established. So the heterogeneity that exists across the landscape makes Wake County a good candidate site for this study. So we chose a paired plot sampling method, which allowed us to compare abundance and metrics of biodiversity between urban and non-urban pairs, while being able to control for other microsite differences. The five study sites selected were within woodlands of at least 20 acres. The urban sites were um, single family residential developments, and you can see an example in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Um, and then the non-urban sites were paired with urban sites that were at least uh, five kilometers apart. So to standardize the paired sites, um, both, both sites exhibited similar slope, aspect, plant density, and forest age. 
So sampling using pitfall traps occurred monthly from March to July in both 2008 and 2009. Um, at each site on each sampling date, a single randomly placed transect of 10 plastic 16 ounce solo cups were buried at soil level. Traps were set by filling by, by about like a quarter full with soapy water. Um, traps were left open for 48 hours and any collected specimens were washed and stored in a 70% ethanol alcohol solution for later ID to order. Some other measurements that were collected on each of the sites were percent coarse woody debris, uh, plant community composition and abundance was evaluated by floral surveys and flower counts and temperature was also taken. So over the course of the two year study, a total of 571 arthropods from 12 different orders was, collect was collected on the urban sites and only 575 arthropods from 11 different orders were collected on the non-urban sites. Um, abundance for each order was calculated for 2008 and 2009 by averaging the total number of collected by the number of traps by the number of sampling events. To determine if there was any significant difference in abundance between urban and non-urban sites, a paired t-test was run for each order. Let's see. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, we found no significant difference in abundance between urban and non-urban sites. They're pretty, I mean, they're pretty close. <laughs> to look at species diversity, I used the Shannon's diversity index and I ran a paired t-test in R as well. And as you can see, we found no significant difference between urban and non-urban sites. And again, to look at evenness, I use the equitability index, which takes into account the Shannon's index. And again, ran a paired t-test to see if there was any significant difference between urban and non-urban sites. And as you can see here, there still was no uh, significant difference. So my hypothesis was not supported with the results from this study, um, as there was no significant difference in abundance, diversity, or evenness. Um, however, within the scientific community, it is still unclear whether or not urbanization is having a negative impact on ground dwelling arthropod communities um, and whether or not it is a factor driving this overall decline in arthropod populations that we're seeing. So there are several factors that could have contributed to the findings, um, which brought up other questions for me that I, I feel warrant future studies. Um, you know, how would these results differ if the study was conducted in a more densely populated area of Wake County? Um, I know, you know, the, the non-urban sites were done in residential areas, which had, you know, a pretty substantial plant community there. Um, but what if we did some type of like radial type um, model where we start kind of at city center and, and collect samples radiating out? Um, to more or less densely populated areas. How would these results differ um, with sites that have experienced recent disturbance from development, those, those residential neighborhoods, you know, they were well established. And uh, how would the arthropod community composition change over time within a, a, recently, desert, a recently disturbed site? And uh, if we were to ID to family, because we only ID to, to order, if we were to ID to family and look at functional groups, um, would we see some functional groups being impacted more than others? So my hope is uh, for future research in this area can be done in a way that utilizes citizen science to help bring awareness to the general public about the overall decline in several arthropod populations. Um, in hopes of gaining more public support for the conservation of arthropods that go beyond those charismatic um, pollinator species like the monarch butterfly or the ladybug. So the greatest challenge for me that I faced with this project was completing the statistical analysis for the data collected. Uh, statistics is not an area I'm strong in. However, I know it's essential to ecological studies. Um, it's definitely an area of development for me. Um, I took on this opportunity in hopes that it would give me more practice and practical application with this skill set. 
This fall, I am entering my first semester as a graduate student, and I am considering minoring in statistics because I, I know it's just an essential part of, uh, of this area of study. So I'd like to thank the Irwin Lab for collecting and sorting through the hundreds of arthropods that were used in this study. A very special thank you to my mentor, Dr. Rebecca Irwin, for her guidance, her patience, and her encouragement, and to my advisor, Dr. McKinney, for her wisdom, enthusiasm, and seeing things in me that I struggle to see in myself. And with that, do we have any questions? Thank you so much, Heather. Mm -hmm. At this time, if any attendees or panelists would like to either raise your hand using the, um, yeah, and I can unmute you. There's the icon in the lower bar of your Zoom menu, or feel free to type your questions straight into the Q&A feature. Um, so when I did my, when I conducted my literature study, I found, I found varying results. Um, for the most part, I, I would say that it's still very divided whether or not urbanization is having an impact on ground dwelling arthropods. Um, but again, a lot of these studies only looked at like the order level, they didn't look at functional groups. I did find two studies that I found really fascinating where they looked at functional groups and they were finding um, that predatory species um, are, are faring a little bit better in an urban area versus prey. And you can see that could, that could become an issue um, if you know, prey species are continually being um, disturbed and their populations are declining because of urbanization, what are those predatory species going to do? Any other questions for Heather? All right, well, if you don't mind, uh, stop sharing your screen. Thank you so much for your presentation. And last, but certainly not least, we have Maddie Townsend, a junior in zoology. So Maddie, feel free to share your screen. Am I good to start whenever? Yep, you're good to go. All right. um, so I'll be talking about the ecological importance of agouti distribution. So just to get some ecological interaction backgrounds on the organisms we're gonna be talking about and stuff. So this is an agouti. These are medium-sized rodents, uh, about the size of maybe a small pet cat for reference. Next, we have an ocelot. Ocelots are medium-sized wild cats that are that commonly prey on agoutis. And by the way, this little rodent in his mouth is not an agouti, it's just another small rodent. Um, this is just a really awesome camera trap picture of his full body. And here we have a collared peccary. So this uh, collared peccaries are very aggressive uh, pig-like animals. They are not closely related to pigs, but they, as you can see, resemble them a lot. Um, and these are one of the agouti's competitors in their environment. So they compete for resources such as housing, food, just all the basics. So agoutis are the primary disperser for this tree here called an almendro tree. So it's a native almond tree in Costa Rica, which is our site of interest for this throughout the study. Our data comes from Costa Rica. So they are the primary disperser for this tree. Uh, agoutis are very good at sitting up on their hind legs, manipulating their hands and using their teeth that are forever growing to crack open these super hard shells um, to disperse the seeds so that uh, these trees can grow everywhere and um, have a better distribution. So this is important because uh, 
animal called the great gray macaw is its primary nesting site actually resides in these um, almendra trees. So these great green macaws are not only beautiful, but they're also endangered, unfortunately, and their numbers are continuously declining. So agoutis are a very important species of interest because if they're dispersing these trees, it means we have kind of an indicator of where this, where these trees will line up for this very important bird um, that is endangered. So what do we want to know? So agoutis are actually a really common species um, in Costa Rica, but we don't know much about the drivers of their distribution. So we wanna figure out which ecological relationships or environmental factors are, strong, are a stronger driver for the presence of this species. So here's another picture of an ocelot. So my hypothesis is out of the many drivers of a goody distribution, I believe that the competitors and predators will have a stronger effect on the distribution of agoutis rather than environmental and human factors. And some predictions I made were there will be a lower occurrence probability of agoutis in areas where predators are detected more. Um, predators are considered ocelots and humans in this um, study. And agoutis will have a higher detection rate near camera traps that are on a trail versus off of a trail because it's kind of like the path of least resistance. It's already there. It's an easy place for them to go. And then predator prey relationships will have a stronger negative effect on agouti detection than competitive relationships. And my thinking here is that predator prey relationship is very direct. And then the competitive relationship is a little more indirect. They're competing for resources, but you know, if your predator comes up and kills you, it's kind of over there in the beginning. So it's more of a direct effect there. So methods, um, our data was collected in La Selva Biological Station uh, in Costa Rica. So this is a protected area. So they're known to have a lot of peccaries and agoutis present in those um, protected areas. Um, the experimental design includes the setup of camera traps in 100 different sites. Uh, there, although there were 100 different sites set up, we only ended up using 70 sites um, of data because that was in the, um, in the core forest, which is, was our place of interest. Um, if you don't know what a core forest is, it's a large intact forest that is beside additional more protected areas that are less impacted by human development and other arthropogenic factors or anthropogenic factors. So the six covariates that we'll be using to kind of figure out more what affects the distribution of these agoutis are ocelots, peccaries, humans, distance from lab clearing, um, presence of the camera on a, or presence of camera trap on a trail versus off of a trail and then if the area was a primary forest. So I used Excel for this to figure out, to convert the um, initial camera detections into detection histories, which I'll show an example of in a minute. So here in this map that's shown uh, where it said La Selva Biological Station, the blue circles, um, represents the agoutis and then the orange circles represent the ocelots. So the bigger the circle, the more detections there were in that area or at that camera trap site. So you see that kind of big blue circle right there and this one will be where a lot of agoutis are found versus one of these tiny circles, there weren't as many found. So just an overview, the camera traps were established and the data, the picture, the photo data were collected. So this is a picture of someone doing, setting up a camera trap. You see it right there on the tree. And then going back to those detection history inputs, um, it's really not how many were there. It's, uh, it's if it was detected or if it was just there or not. So an example would be if this could be up here, these numbers for any particular animal, let's say it was an agouti. Um, we have the days here. So it says if we're looking at site one, TT001, on day one, there's a zero there. So that means nothing was detected of the species of interest. Um, day two, 
there's a one there. So it means that something was detected in the camera trap data. And then the same pattern continues three, four, five, there's a zero. So nothing of the species of interest was detected. And same with six and seven, there's a one. So something was detected. Then we found our occupancy model created in R, which I'll show um, in the results what we got for that. And then we interpret the data. And up here, we have another cute little picture of um, an agouti. And we'll see more about their importance and what we found. So here are the results we got from uh, the R system. So we see here, peccary came up on top. So the most important thing we're going to look at in this chart is the weight, which is WT. And it's bolded here, and we see it's 0.94. So what this actually means in you know, common sense, it's 94% of the model support suggests that the collared peccaries um, are the main factor associated with the occurrence of these agoutis. So, oh, see. so here's some other really important information we found. Um, so we found that the p-value, the peccary association, was a negative association with the presence of agoutis. So that's actually a large negative correlation. So basically, um, the more detection of peccaries that there are in, at a specific camera trap site means there will probably be less detections of agoutis at that site as well. So using a 5% significance as in a lot of statistical methods. Um, we got our p-value to be 0 0.033, which means that it was, we found it was statistically significant. And then as far as the trail association goes, there is a positive correlation. Um, so detections, this is for detections of agoutis on or off of a trail, and we found that was a strong positive correlation. So we were more likely to find um, a higher rate of detection of agoutis on the trails. So the peccary was found to be the most statistically significant covariate that results in a negative relationship with agoutis. So this means in areas where peccaries were more frequently detected, agoutis were less likely to occur. And here we have a picture of some agoutis on that site um, at the biological center. Um, like I said, they're very common there, um, mostly because uh, it's a protected site and there are no hunters because they're frequently hunted in Costa Rica for meat. So my hypothesis was and wasn't supported. Um, while the ocelot was kind of significant, it was not only not that significant, we found statistically, but it was also a positive correlation, whereas originally I figured it would be a negative correlation. Um, it makes sense considering they are out seeking their food, their prey, so it makes sense that they would both be present in, that, in the same areas. Uh, but I thought it was interesting. Um, and then as far as the animal interactions versus the environmental um, covariants. So the ocelot wasn't true. The, the predator-prey interactions um, didn't support my hypothesis, but the uh, competitor's relationship did support my hypothesis that those would have a greater effect on the agouti present. So the ocelot, we found that its correlation or its, uh, yeah, its correlation was a positive 0.26 correlation. So not very strong and also positive. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So um, as peccary detection is more frequent, there are less occurrences of agoutis in those same areas. And also it's important to keep in mind, there were some associations between many of the covariates but some were just not as strong as others. And we didn't think, or I didn't think actually would have that great of an effect on their distribution. So some downfalls, I was, I also had trouble with R. Um, my mentor had to help me a lot with that, but also thinking of kind of a bigger picture of the actual method we used of the camera trap data. It represents correlations, not causation. So I tried to figure out some other methods that if I was interested in future research or thinking of just what could someone else do with this information, you could do, you could figure out more direct effects um, that could be monitored by new GPS tracking, which 
would help a little more with that causation rather than just kind of making correlations. So applications. Um, my results, I think, provide great insight to where goodies are found more often and therefore uh, where the almendra tree will be more likely to grow, which Michael, I'll explain a little um, in a minute. It's very important for these great green macaws. Also effects of competition on species. This little graph here, I didn't create it, but it's um, just kind of an overarching thing to say that there used to be more species of these peccaries. This one that we're interested in is called the collared peccary. Um, and there were even kind of meaner looking um, peccaries than the ones we saw. And so those eventually got driven out. And so now the kind of big guy of the forest is that peccary that's still there. Um, and so it just kind of is a way to show how cascading effect that these competition relationships are. And that if one species goes away, it can change the competition dynamics in the forest. And if the peccary now has an effect on the agouti, the agouti will have effect on where the trees are planted and uh, dispersed. And that will eventually have an effect on this great green macaw and where it can be and live. So future research, I think it would be interesting to get more data on the agoutis and ocelots, considering it wasn't what I expected. I thought there would be a more negative association between the detection of ocelots and agoutis. And then the great three recalls, of course, um, going back to the beginning when I discussed the ecological importance of uh, the trees and the agoutis on the dispersal of those seeds. I think if we found out where these agoutis were residing more, we could figure out where these trees would be more likely to pop up. And therefore we could, you know, figure out, conservationists could figure out what sites we're wanting to protect more because of where these great green macaws will most likely be going to and will be nesting in so we can protect those sites since it is an endangered bird, which I think is really important. A special thank you to Dr. Michael Cove um, from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. He is the research curator of mammalogy and he was a great mentor with everything going on with COVID, very accommodating and also doing it all over Zoom. Um, I'm sure it was pretty crazy for him, but he did an awesome job teaching me some new statistics stuff and um, really cool mammalogy interactions of Costa Rica. And if anyone has any questions, I'll try my best to answer those. Awesome, thanks so much, Maddie. Thank you. If any of our, we have a hand raised from one of our uh, panelists. Heather, would you like to unmute and ask your question live? Uh, unmute, there you go, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was interested, you, um, you would like more data on the ocelot um, dynamic. I was wondering, um, did you look more into the natural history of the ocelot? Is the, um, is the agouti kind of like a, um, a major source of, of its, of its, you know, of its food? Is that, is that why you want more information on the ocelot, on the ocelot dynamic? Because that's kind of like their preferred, their preferred prey? Or I shouldn't say preferred prey. That's a bad <laughs> word to use. Um, is it is it a, a substantial is it a substantial uh, prey species for them? Got you. So um, yes, I didn't look directly into um, kind of the majority of what it eats as far as just the agouti, but it definitely is primary source is smaller rodents. So I would say yes. Um, considering it was one of, you know, my mentor, I talked to him when I originally, he was kind of giving out ideas and I was like, that's a really cool interaction. I think, I think um, different kind of cats are cool. And so I was like, I'd be interested to know more about the predator prey kind of dynamics. So I would say it probably is one of its main, um, main prey since they are pretty abundant. Um, and yeah, I would be I would be interested to know that. I should look, definitely look up more of the natural history and if it prefers that over other small rodents. I'm actually not sure about that, but I know it does primarily eat a lot of rodents. Thanks. 
Has anybody else got a question um, either to ask live or to type into the Q&A feature? All right, well, thank you all so much for joining me today, um, for joining all of us today uh, on this Friday afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about our applied ecology minor students research. And I hope you've also found this to be an incredibly inspiring way to wrap up a Friday afternoon and our spring semester. Um, so let's go ahead and give our uh, presenters a last round of virtual applause. I'll just say, yeah, <laughs> well done everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, we look forward to hearing more about uh, what all of you do in the future. So thanks, y'all. Bye. <laughs>